Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Didi Petri, President and CEO of the Olmstead Network. Yes, that's right. The National Association for Olmstead Parks is now the Olmstead Network. It's been our pleasure over the last two years to serve as the managing partner of Olmstead 200 and to celebrate, explore, and interrogate the enduring legacy of social reformer and landscape architect Frederick Law Olmstead. We have been honored to work with a fantastic honorary committee, nine other national partners, and hundreds of local and regional partners throughout the United States and abroad. April 26, 2023 was Olmstead's 201st birthday, and I hope all of you took time to raise a glass. If you didn't, there's no better way to thank Mr. Olmstead than to make a donation right now to the Olmstead Network. As the old saying goes, Olmstead's not getting older, he's just getting better. And today we'll aim to explore how. Our inspiration, Frederick Law Olmstead Designing America, a wonderful documentary about Frederick Law Olmstead. The film explores Olmstead and his vision of parks as a necessity of urban life. It also acknowledges Olmstead's role as a proto-environmentalist, advocating the creation of national parks decades before the environmental movement. This film was made in 2014, directed by Larry Hott, and with the support, research, and hard work of consulting producer Lawrence Cotton. Larry is a friend of Olmstead and so many of us on this Zoom today. So thank you, Larry, and thank you for pointing us to some excellent additional resources that we've noted in the chat box. Many of you will remember we opened the bicentennial with a watch party and panel discussion, that time about Olmstead and America's urban parks. Today, we offer a similar conversation. It's a treat to reunite cast members now nearly a decade later to talk about why Olmstead still matters and what all of us can do going forward. For starters, I know that I have matured, as they say, since 2014. So we'll check out everybody on today's panel but more importantly, we'll be focused on Frederick Law Olmstead. How does Olmstead look after 201 years? And what can we learn from him? How has Olmstead aged? To tackle our questions, we have four terrific individuals today. We're especially pleased to welcome as our moderator, Morgan Monaco, third president of the Prospect Park Alliance and Prospect Park Administrator. Morgan is the latest in the line of extraordinary women who have been involved in protecting and preserving Prospect Park for the last 35 years, starting with the incomparable Tupper Thomas, whom we saw in this movie, moving to Susan Donahue, now New York City Parks Commissioner, and now Morgan. The one thing I know they all share is a belief that Prospect, not Central Park, was Olmstead and Vox's greatest achievement. So I invite our audience to weigh in in the chat box. And we've got Boston here today too, so feel free to throw in the emerald necklace. <laughs> also joining us is Garrett Bash Nelson, a historical geographer. Now, if I may say so, Garrett looks mighty young in this film. And indeed, he was still a student when this program was taped. Now he serves as the director of the Leventhal Map Center at the Boston Public Library and has Olmstead's emerald necklace as his backyard. The Map Center and the Emerald Necklace Conservancy, Olmstead Now Initiative, have been wonderful partners of Olmstead 200. We want to thank the library for its provocative and inspiring bicentennial exhibit, More or Less in Common, Environment and Justice in the Human Landscape. And we have linked to its digital version and another excellent essay by Garrett in the chat box. Our remaining panelists are real rock stars in the galaxy of Olmstead authors and commentators. Sarah Cedar Miller has been the historian emerita of the Central Park Conservancy since 2017. She is a celebrated author and photographer and was honored with the Preservation Hero Award by the Library of American Landscape History in 2020 and the Central Park Conservancy's Frederick Law Olmsted Award in 2023. Just a few days ago, her new book, Before Central Park, received a Landscape Studies Initiative Award from the University of Virginia School of Architecture. Congratulations, Sarah. I can say without exaggeration that your in-person tour introduced me to the wonders of Central Park, and I will be forever grateful. Finally, our good friend, Justin Martin, author of Genius of Place. 
For so many, Justin's book is the first introduction to FLO. Thank you, Justin, for that. Over the last 20 months, I have ruthlessly stolen, with credit, of course, Justin's line that Olmsted's middle name should have been serendipity. Mm -hmm. The Olmsted Network has also taken to heart Justin's observation that Olmsted is perhaps the most important historical figure that the average American knows least about. We pledge to continue to expand education and understanding about the multifaceted career and vision of Frederick Law Olmsted. For those of you who are Justin Martin groupies, here's your chance. On June 10, the Olmsted Network is co-hosting a special symposium at Forest Hill Gardens outside of New York City. Forest Hills is a community designed by Frederick Law Olmsted Jr., and Justin will be talking about it and the Olmsteads. You can find out how to register in the chat box. So let's get going. Please let us know where you are from in the chat box and submit any questions you have through the Q&A box. We will answer as many audience questions as possible and plan to conclude in one hour. With that, I'm pleased to pass the baton to Morgan to start this conversation. Thank you, Morgan, and welcome, everybody. Thank you, Dee Dee. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm so delighted to be here. How fun it is to see you nearly a decade after this film was made. Um, speaking of aging, my first question, you know, some time has passed since this was filmed. So the question for all of us, how have Olmsted's work and values aged? Do Olmsted landscapes still have a valuable role to play in addressing today's challenges of social justice, public health, particularly coming out of a global pandemic, and of course the threat of climate change? Who wants to tackle that first? I'll, I'll, pick up, I'll pick up the public health thread. And what I guess I would say is now is a time in particular in our history in which um, people are very tethered to their cell phones. And so from a public health standpoint, once upon a time at Olmsted Park was important as a place to get fresh air, still can provide that. But also um, Olmsted Park's more than ever at a time which people are having a lot of mental struggles in some cases with, with social media and their phones. They're a great place to go get unplugged, untethered from a phone, and contemplate nature. So they, they provide a social health benefit here in the 21st century, very, very far afield from what Olmsted might have envisioned when he was designing those parks in the 19th century. And um, I could also comment on the environmental issues that we are all struggling with today. Olmsted was a real early leader in uh, creating beautiful environments and the parks particularly the parks and urban centers are, you know, so important to cities and they're cooler. They bring in, you know, fresh uh, uh, oxygen and uh, carbon dioxide. Uh, everything is much more, um, bet is better, warm, uh, cooler in the summer. And uh, without the trees, uh, the cities would, would not be places people want to live. But um, Olmsted was a visionary when it came to environmental issues. So we, we really thank him for that today. And yeah. Morgan, I'll maybe hazard a, a comment about the social dimensions of Olmsted's work. Uh, and particular, what's changed in our world since 2014 uh, when we were all a part of this original program? You know, I think uh, one way of, of framing that is that the ideas about commonality and coming together uh, as citizens, as residents of a city, uh, has become both more challenging and more important, perhaps, since that time. We've both seen how our society is cut through by all sorts of inequalities and divisions, both real and fabricated, um, in ways that make maybe some of the uh, more easygoing ideas that people just come together and be fine in a park, uh, a little bit uh, harder to swallow, um, but at the same time makes that vision, the possibility of shared spaces, of common spaces, even more vital, even more crucial, even as it perhaps is slipping away from us in, in some cases. That's an excellent point and leads nicely, actually, to my next question to you, Sarah. Um, you give tours regularly through Central Park, and you know it so very well, um, which is an incredible skill. Um, what have you learned on the ground that is helpful insight into Olmsted's park design that may not be necessarily conveyed directly in the film? 
Uh, well, there is one facet of Olmsted's design that actually surprised me long, and I realized it uh, long after um, I worked here, and that is that Olmsted uh, and Box were listening to when they were first designing the park. There were the people who, uh, the elite, uh, genteel people in New York who were, did not want to mix with the working class people. And so they said, well, we just want our carriage ride and our bridal trail, and we're going to stay in our horse, on our horse or in our carriage. And, um, you know, we won't be with the hoi polloi of the population. And what Olmsted and Vox did that was so brilliant is that they made the most beautiful parts of Central Park only for the pedestrian. And so if you wanted to walk in the Ramble or walk in the North Woods or see the beautiful waterfalls or go down the mall and see the American Elms and uh, walk on the Esplanade, that's Bethesda Terrace or underneath to see the beautiful mint and tile ceiling, then you were out of luck if you just wanted to stay in your carriage or uh, or on your horse. And so when you actually now walk on the drives, as opposed to walking in the park, you really see so much less. I mean, it's beautiful, of course, there are trees and, and paths, but it's nothing like the intimate experience of walking on a pedestrian path. So I think that is one of the great elements of the design that most people just simply miss. Yes, that really resonates with us here at Prospect Park. Similarly, the grand entrance at Grand Army Plaza, you know, when you come through the two arches, you go through a really transformative experience, you know, coming out of Metaport Arch, for example, and you come in through the grand expanse of the Long Meadow and you just are transported to a new realm. So um, I, I agree with you. That's the beauty and brilliance in, in his design thinking. Um, Garrett, for you, as now the head of the Leventhal Map Center, as Dee Dee said, the Boston Public Library, which sponsored an exhibit during the biennial called More or Less in Common, Environment and Justice in the Human Landscape. Among other things, the exhibit challenged us to build better and healthier environments. If Olmsted were here today, what would he want us to do? What new perspectives can we bring to Olmsted landscapes now nearly a decade later? Yeah, thanks, Morgan. You know, it's hard to pick up a 201-year-old guy and translate him directly into the concerns of our current world. But one thing that we really emphasize in our exhibition, and which I know will be familiar to anybody who's spent time thinking about Olmsted, but which is maybe less familiar to your sort of average person engaging with a park, is that parks are deeply political. They were political for Olmsted. Uh, we know from Justin's work and other historians that Olmsted himself was in many ways more of a politician and an advocate and a reformer than he was a designer and a landscape architect for the first half of his life. So he himself would be not only com comfortable, uh, but I think he would be an advocate for us thinking about what parks do to shape and reshape the societies around them. He wouldn't want us to just kind of preserve them in amber and pretend like they just kind of exist outside of the other concerns of our life. So, you know, we can't pick up Olmsted's politics directly and bring them right into our current world. The, his milieu, the things that were going on in his world were very different than uh, some of the challenges we face today. But I think some of the basic principles are still there. The idea that we can use space, we can use design, we can use the ways that people in a city interact with one another as a potentially positive force to change outcomes that go far beyond what happens in the park. Yes, and, and helping to, as you said earlier, really hone in on some of the social uh, justice issues as being the, these places for democracy um, and where people from all walks of life really can gather and find a common uh, joy and respite from city life. Yeah. In many ways, we, you know, we're facing a crisis of democracy that's not unlike the lead up to the Civil War in which Olmsted kind of formed his uh, most important ideas, you know, his, in his work as a journalist, in his work as an abolitionist. Um, those are all the things that Olmsted was thinking about and concerned about, and that 
in many ways came to a head in his park making work. Um, you know, we have crises that are not exactly the same, but are similarly challenging. And, you know, uh, I think perhaps people wouldn't, wouldn't immediately turn to urban parks as one of the things that might be a way of, uh, uh, way into some of the, 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 the possibilities of, of challenging or, or addressing some of those problems. But much as it, uh, much as was true in the middle of the 19th century, um, those possibilities are still there. Yes, and that makes me think, um, transitioning back over to you, Sarah, briefly, um, speaking of the Civil War, you know, we briefly mentioned what happened before Central Park, um, but you've now written a whole book on this topic and explored the layers of this history. What can you tell us? Well, we do know um, a great deal about Central Park and prior to it, um, it had many different communities. Uh, Seneca Village, uh, the African-American property owning community is the most famous, uh, but there was also a community of German farmers, Irish uh, farmers, uh, namely with piggeries. Um, there were uh, Jewish cemeteries in Central Park. So uh, and then there were um, families that had owned the land for centuries. And in 1852, New York City actually auctioned off um, most of what became the land that became Central Park only a few years earlier, and they had to buy it back. The city owned it and held an auction only a year before they made it um, officially a park in 1853, which is very confusing. But um, all of these communities, um, of course, were displaced. They were paid. A lot of people don't realize, um, you know, or want to know, uh, was it fair uh, in the Constitution, um, a, a public uh, municipality can take a place for the public for private land, uh, eminent domain, if just it's just compensation. That's the words in the uh, Constitution. And in fact, with my research, I did find that it was, in fact, fair and people were paid uh, their uh, market value, fair market value. But of course, communities being displaced is troublesome, upsetting, and difficult for all groups and no, no different than in Central Park. We have to learn to be far more sensitive to groups, uh, whether we make new parks or what the communities are surrounding parks, in the uh, earlier days, they weren't so sensitive. Today, I think we would be need to be much more sensitive in our. Thank you, Sarah. Yes, excellent point. And I want to come back to that in a minute, just in terms of um, that balance of honoring the, the past while we live in the present. But um, switching gears briefly to Justin, um, public parks are considered a radical idea in the 19th century. And even today, many people fail to realize that natural spaces were created by landscape architects and aren't self-sustaining. Um, you're not a landscape architect, but what prompted you to be interested in Olmsted? And why should anyone be interested in Frederick Law Olmsted or Flo today? I got interested in Olmsted basically as an appreciator. I hung out in Central Park when I first came to New York. Um, my wife and I got married in Central Park in the dairy. Um, my wife grew up in Rochester across the street from Highland Park. So I knew a little bit about Olmsted and I knew, I certainly knew that he was an important figure, but I basically, before I ever set out to write the book, I simply appreciate his creations and sort of the revelation to me when I did my research for the book was learning how just incredibly thoughtful design spaces of those parks. So I think people often think that landscape architecture, people naively think that landscape architecture might be just sort of plant some trees, you know, find a lake, what have you. But what I really learned was that Olmsted, these parks were intensely designed. And not only are they intensely designed, but here it is um, 150 years on from some of his creations. And um, when you're when you're moving through one of his creations, you're actually doing the things moving in the way that he hoped you would, which is kind of an incredible thing to have an artist who actually can control your movement and your appreciation of a landscape. And I'll give just one quick example, which is the Ramble in Central Park. I mean, the Ramble's probably, I don't know, maybe eight acres. It's not very large, but you can get desperately lost in the Ramble. That is 
exactly as Olmsted intended. He wanted there to be something in an urban setting where you could just get and profoundly lost. And even to this day, that can happen. That's that's Olmsted's intent in in in, um, in operation. Yes, excellent. Uh, Garrett or Sarah, anything else to add from your perspective? Why should anyone be interested in Olmsted today? Because he was um, the preeminent designer of urban parks that did, for all the reasons we're talking about, bring people together. Um, Garrett really addressed it really well. And um, I think that more than ever, we need parks to bring people together. That's what was so surprising about Olmsted was that the people did get off their horse and did get out of their carriage and walk with everyone else because they did need, they wanted to appreciate nature. And the one thing that brings everyone in the world together is that we all love nature. And, and Olmsted made beautiful naturalistic landscapes that um, we can all appreciate even more so today, thanks to the people who take care of it, whether it's a private organization or a municipality. And I would yeah. just add, you know, one, as a historian, uh, one of the things that interests me in the study of history generally is, is, you know, we find all sorts of connections and ways of understanding the world that either aren't as resonant with us today or represent kind of roads not taken that uh, kind of feed our creative imaginations for the future. And Olmsted's so interesting, you know, both Sarah and Justin have alluded to this in the way that he kind of makes connections that aren't obvious to us today, right? Here's a guy who wrote a book on farming and, you know, became uh, one of the most important civic designers in the nation's largest city. Uh, he's a guy who is interested in providing free public services to people. He was also deeply connected to kind of elite movements. Um, you know, he was thinking about transforming nature in a way that, that uh, you know, that, that we might not think about today. And he, you know, gave gave birth to a whole engineering movement. So, you know, there's all sorts of like interesting threads of, of overlap and a possibility that kind of confound some of our categories today. Uh, and I think what that points at is, is some of the connections or, or, the, or the kind of creative ways of thinking that, that might be useful to us, uh, you know, 201 years later. Yes, absolutely. He was truly a, a Renaissance man. He lived so many different lives and had so many different um, careers or um, exposure, many different disciplines. And that really created the multidimensionality for his perspective. Um, and that's a great segue to my next question. You know, there's an often used phrase, Olmsted's living legacy. We know that parks are not static and continue to adapt to changing needs and purposes. What do you all believe is acceptable and appropriate change? And what change destroys the essence of Olmsted's design and principles? So where's that threshold? How do we you know, pay homage? How do we have fidelity to his vision while also giving our space, our, ourselves the, the space to adapt to modern needs? Well, I could um, talk about uh, the fact that the park, I like to say that Central Park is about one third exactly the same, one third slightly different, and one third entirely different. And that entirely different is the Moses era and the era of recreation and the fact that many of Vox's beautiful bridges and um, buildings were bricked up and now you go through the park and the, the differences uh, in some of the elements are not as lovely as they used to be, um, but people were, you know, there was a meadow and they never wanted anything in the park to be single use. And then they started with the tennis center in 1930, and then the, uh, the meadows became ball fields. Uh, 30, uh, 21 playgrounds started surrounding the perimeter of the park. And it ruined um, a, a lot of Olmsted's vision, uh, but things changed with the times and it was during the depression and Robert Moses came in, um, he did some damage. He also understood that um, 
people were out of work and they needed places and they needed recreation and he created recreation centers and mass events started coming in, which Olmsted was against. Now you can't even imagine parks without the big concerts and the big events and the ways, other ways in which people come together collectively as, as um, a group, like when they celebrated the anniversary of the Statue of Liberty. There was a big concert in Central Park uh, or even the Brooklyn Bridge, I think there was a big concert. So, you know, people come together and want to be together, which is um, unifying in a way that Olmsted was against. But um, we adapt. Uh, some are really tough to adapt to, uh, particularly a lot of the ways in which the drives are being used today how, uh, with those fast little vehicles and pedicabs. And it's a challenge and we're we're facing it at the Central Park Conservancy and I'm sure many other parks, I'm sure Prospect Park is also facing it that way too. Uh, and um, it's a challenge that uh, is our challenge to manage now. Garrett, Justin, what are your thoughts? I'll throw, I'll throw out one quick thought, which is, Kind of as Sarah said, it's it's quite a challenge. And one thing that always strikes me is is Olmsted, um, when the when the question is being true to Olmsted's vision, Olmsted himself, I mean, he created these um, parks, but they were giant civic undertakings, giant civic projects. And in fact, um, any park, whether it be Central Park or parks all over the country, actually a lot of those actually a lot of change and. Um, um, adaptation that was introduced even at the point these parks were designed. And just to give one simple example, Olmsted hated statues, but Central Park has lots of statues. Many of his other parks do too. And I think a lot of people would agree that, that that's a that's a welcome addition. So in some ways, Olmsted's own own vision was was compromised even at the moment he was creating these parks. But to answer to sort of the larger, so that that, that uh, what I guess I'm saying there, that adds a, an additional level of challenge. But to address sort of the main question, one thing I would say is is um, Olmsted, um, you have to sort of create a hierarchy, I, I think, in a way of what his different values were. And at the very top to me was that he was about fostering democracy, something Garrett referred to earlier. And so when thinking about, when contemplating making any kind of change in Olmsted Park, one thing I think is a useful prism to look at that through is the notion, is this, is this change going to foster democracy in the park? And so something like adding a playground to a park, a new playground is going to be pretty modern. It's probably not going to look anything like a playground that Olmsted and Vox would have designed in their day. But if it's an opportunity to foster democracy, it might make sense to do in an Olmsted creation. Uh, just, just, a, just sort of a general thought. Yeah, I similarly tend to take a sort of um, uh, less originalist view, I guess. Uh, you know, I, of course, uh, personally, I am deeply moved by, you know, the most well-preserved Olmsted landscapes, and I love spending time in them. Um, but, you know, I think two things to, to really emphasize as we think about a, a living legacy. One, you know, is this really important point that Justin made about what a parks do for a democracy, right? How do people experience them? Um, what functions do they have in terms of allowing people to step sort of outside of their ordinary lives and meet other people on equal terms? Um, and another thing I think that that sometimes gets missed is that um, Olmsted was really thinking about the city as a kind of comprehensive landscape, right? He we, he, we know him for the parks as specific spaces and oftentimes named spaces. Um, but, you know, Boston is a great example where in designing a network of parks, the Emerald Necklace, he was really thinking about how to reform the entire city, right? How to shape the landscape at the scale of a complex growing industrial city. Um, many of Olmsted's most important followers and acolytes, you know, brought that into the into the next century and continued to think about, uh, you know, region-wide or, or metropolitan-wide uh, landscape improvements. So I think those are some of the things that, that, you know, when we think about picking up where Olmsted left off in the late 19th century, bringing it up to how we live today, what our cities are like, is is thinking both about functions, thinking about how a, a park fits into a larger set of both social and kind of landscape, uh, uh, a larger setting of, of, of an urban region. Yes, thank you, Garrett. That's an excellent point and does lead to 
um, my next question. But before I do, I just want to add, um, uh, Sarah, your point is well taken in terms of adapting multiple uses um, simultaneously. And I think a good example in Prospect Park, um, you know, we have the wonderful concert grove and um, music island that really has fidelity to his original design and vision. Um, and then right next to it, we have our lakeside, our you know beautiful new um, modern um, ice skating um, uh, and splash pad uh, rink. Um, which, you know, does uh, the building, the facility is a modern design, but it was really thoughtful in terms of blending in with the landscape. And so we have these two sections of the park in dialogue or station with each other um, that we've um, done a lot of work to really blend seamlessly. Um, and I think it takes a lot of appreciation for, again, the values. And, and I love um, what you said uh, about, the, you know, uh, is this, you know, ask ourselves the question, is this going to foster democracy? And so we have uh, right now, very diverse usership in both sections of that park, uh, of that section of the park. Um, but Garrick, I really appreciate what you said in terms of city as a comprehensive landscape, um, because that really gets to a, you know, a, a existential question I think we all are grappling with, especially those who are in these public-private partnerships, um, to think about myths and resources. So Olmsted understood that parks are not luxuries. In fact, they're in critical part of our infrastructure that all of our cities need. Um, and we've seen, of course, as a result of the pandemic, greater use than ever. But unfortunately, public funding does not always follow with the increase in demand and usership. Um, so how do we go about changing this? How do we make the case um, that parks are an essential part of what it means to be an urban environment? I've got my thoughts, but I, I open it to the group. I do think that in in a real way, and this is not just the fact that we're all uh, you know a decade older uh, and getting uh, and getting grouchier, but I do think there's a real way in which we are losing the ability to kind of think big about urban challenges and and urban solutions, right? I mean, Central Park was uh, revolutionary when it was introduced into Manhattan. It was a massive, massive public works project, and you know, uh, we tend to find ourselves in situations today where even minor, minor interventions, you know, a bike lane along one block of, of road, uh, you know, becomes a, a multi-decade project. Uh, you know, part of that is good because as, um, as Sarah alluded to before, we're more careful and cautious about making sure that different voices are included and that not, you know, one man like Olmsted has the power to single-handedly reshape a city just the way he wants it done. Um, so it's, it, in a sense, it is, it is good that we are, you know, we have a more collaborative, more participatory um, process for, for making changes in the city. But one consequence is, uh, or one consequence of that is that um, sometimes we've lost the ability to think about what, what would, what would a, what would a big scale uh, sort of change in our cities look like? What would it look like to totally rethink how streets work or how highways work or how parks are connected to one another or how landscapes at the scale of individual buildings uh, look. Um, those those things have gotten, I think, really difficult. And, and, and it's actually hard for us now to imagine back in you know the mid to late 19th century just how transformative, just how radical, just how massive these projects were when they were first built. Yes, I, I would like to address the whole issue of um, the skyscrapers that are surrounding Central Park. Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. said that the tall buildings, because remember, Olmsted and Vox actually never thought that buildings would go above the tree level. Uh, that was in 1858, but uh, Otis invented the elevator in 1857, and it was all, you know, going to be changing. And now we have these superstructures over Central Park. Um, Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. said that the skyline ruined his father's masterpiece. And uh, but we we celebrated the frame of the beautiful landscape painting, but now it's changed. And you know we need more communication with developers and with the city and zoning laws uh, to change to make sure that city that parks aren't taken over by these looming uh, buildings that will not only bring shadow, but just diminish the, the nature of nature. 
and um, you know, cement and steel and glass over nature. And so this is what the park was created to be, be against. And now it's really homing in and it's, um, it's really something that cities must really pay attention to the skyline and what surrounds the, the park and, and the kind of zoning laws that they should do. It's too late for 57th Street, but it's not too late for many cities. Um, and I would also like to um, address the whole idea of the city's budgets, because that's where um, why we have conservancies, because cities, uh, the minute they have to cut something, they cut parks. They think of parks as the cherry on the icing on the cake. Parks are the cake. They are a quality, uh, quality of life issue. Without parks, nobody would want to live in New York City. Without Central Park or the other wonderful parks, and, and also everybody wants to live near Prospect Park in Brooklyn because you want to be near nature and you want to watch the change of the seasons and, and you want to recreate. Uh, which everyone does almost daily now, and you wouldn't have that. And the city's budgets are um, always cutting parks, and we need to vote for people who are pro park because that's where um, that's where it started out in 1851 with Central Park. Um, people were voting for the mayor who wanted a public park, and things have not changed a bit. We have to use the voting booth as a tool to rescue parks and rescue the budget for parks. And of course, um, as a longstanding employee of the Central Park Conservancy, what's wonderful about these private organizations are that people can see their own involvement immediately. Um, Dick Yelder, who was a major uh, donor to the Central Park Conservancy said, what he liked is that you can smell the product of your investment. <laughs> and so um, you you just, um, you know, that that's it. You, you give to a hospital, you don't know where your dollar is, or, you know, you hope they're building wings and doing wonderful research. I mean, that's not to knock that very, very important part of uh, charitable giving. But when you give to a park, whether it's through volunteering, or whether it's just picking up after you know your picnic, or whether you're donating to a conservancy like the Central Park Conservancy or the Prospect Park Alliance, you are seeing the product um, immediately from your investment. And that gives people a sense of ownership and a sense of pride in their community and a sense of pride in the park. So, um, you know, Olmsted, he felt the same way. He wanted more involvement, uh, you know, over the city because he felt that through the vicissitudes of politics or the vicissitudes of um, the economy that parks were going to lose. And uh, we have learned over the last 42 years that parks are some of the greatest achievements, the Cinderella's of, of all municipalities because people can really make a difference on an individual basis. Also the Homestead Network. <laughs> <laughs> well said, Sarah. You've got us all fired up. You have a, a second life as a community organizer, I feel. You've you got <laughs> talking points to make the case to City Hall. I love it. Um, Dustin, anything else to add from your perspective? On the only thing I'd add, um, kind of picking up, um, dovetailing with, with what Sarah said, is stewardship has a huge value. And, and one of the forms of stewardship is just having the awareness that these are you know, beautiful design spaces that Frederick Law Olmsted, Vox, and others are the people behind them. It actually makes, I can give one very good example, which is Rochester, where my wife grew up. When she was growing up, nobody had ever even heard of Frederick Law Olmsted. Now, probably a decent percentage of the city could tell you who Frederick Law Olmsted is, and that has a very practical effect because, because people know who Frederick Law Olmsted is, because they know that Highland Park isn't just some random park, but it's a Frederick Law Olmsted park, they're more likely to volunteer. They're also more likely to take good care of the park. I know back in the 70s, Central Park famously there was graffiti and problems because people weren't caring about the park and it's caught falling into some, some level of disrepair. Well, Rochester parks, parks all over the, the country, because people know more about Frederick Law Olmsted now, they're more inclined to treat them well, to volunteer, and certainly not to, you know, um, abuse them with graffiti and so forth. So stewardship is a, is a really important um, um, 
roll at a time when budgets in cities are certainly um, squeezed. Yes, yes, absolutely. And I'll you know, add from my perspective as president of the Prospect Park Alliance, I think it's a, a both and. I think in the near term, you know, the city does need the private sector to step in and help to support to enhance uh, public services. And I'm grateful, you know, uh, the Alliance was founded by Tupper Thomas, who um, was featured in the film. And she really believed in this partnership, this alliance between um, residents, people who live nearby, um, and the city coming together to actually join forces and, and enhance a, an incredible civic amenity for the entire city um, and certainly for the borough. Um, but it also does, as Sarah said, it does take that organizing and advocacy perspective to really make the city hall. This is not okay. You know, parks can't be always on the chopping block. This has to be prioritized if we really care about the health and well-being of our citizenry. So um, I, I agree. I think it takes both. Yeah, there is a role um, for uh, the private sector and, and residents to play for sure, but we also have to keep the emphasis on our civic leadership to make sure that this is a priority and, and makes makes it in the city's budget. Um, I know we've got some wonderful questions coming in, but before I turn it over to some audience questions, uh, some final words um, from each of you as you look to the next 200 years, what message to all of us who care about Olmsted's parks and principles? Um, well, I can answer, uh, it's a little bit of what I have already um, talked about just now, but uh, a lot of uh, cities uh, and a lot of um, even uh, municipalities, uh, uh, conservancy, less conservancies, they um, restore the park. They get the budget from the city or they raise the money and they restore the park, but they don't have a plan for the management and stewardship of the parks. And what's important that Olmsted fought for and really understood deeply was that unless you have management and budget and maintenance stewardship plans, don't bother to restore it because you will lose the trust of the community. You will lose your investment, whether it's private or public investment. And everyone needs to understand that maintenance and management are crucial. So you need to strengthen your parks department or, or um, allow conservancies to you know, have private funding because the Olmsted legacy really relies on a healthy environment, a healthy park. And you're not going to have that if you restore something and have no plan to maintain it. And so the most important thing that Olmsted felt was that you have to have strong management. And of course, you know, that has resonated throughout the country these days because otherwise, um, you just, you're back where you started from. Yes, well said. So since, yes. since the question involves looking out 200 years into the future, I'll, 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 I'll sort of try to tackle that from the standpoint that we're, we're all very fortunate that Olmsted and Vox and various partners that he worked with were working in the 19th century when cities were growing up, American cities were. And, and so in the middle of all kinds of cities, whether you're talking Rochester or Buffalo or New York City or Louisville, fortunately, there's green space in the middle of those cities, often designed by Olmsted. But looking forward to, to the next 200 years, one thing that strikes me is, is there's the opportunity for many parks to be built, sometimes in suburban areas, sometimes in exurban areas, far afield from, from the middle of cities. But Olmsted's design principles, um, they still carry, they still hold. And so looking forward 200 years from now, hopefully a lot of other parks will be designed in, um, in other parts of cities. Um, and they will be, um, hopefully people will um, use Olmsted's timeless principles to design those parks. And, and I, th I think the, the country would benefit from that over the coming 200 years to have, to have many more Olmsted design parks designed um, out, in, in various parts of the city. And I think, you know, if we're, if we're being really optimistic, you know, what would another 200 years of the, the sort of, you know, arc of history that, that, that started with Olmsted look like, um, you know, I think Olmsted was really concerned, not just about the parks being there, but by uh, the idea that 
everybody in a city would care about the parks, right? It wasn't it wasn't supposed to be this sort of niche thing that, you know, a handful of enthusiasts would, you know, would look after or that, you know, some people would be really interested in recreation or environmental issues, but that it would really be something that everybody felt a sense of common ownership. Uh, you know, that's really the, when he visits Birkenhead Park and England, which is one of his early aha moments, the thing that really astounds him is that everybody in the town sort of kind of invested in it. They care about it. They see it as their part. And um, I think we still have a long ways to go uh, in, in, in that trajectory. Um, many, many people love and care about the, the public spaces of their communities and their cities. Um, but I think there's still a lot of work to do. I think, uh, um, you know, we still... Uh, you know, we're, we're aware of the way that certain environmental challenges or environmental forces really do bind us all together, right? Climate change is such an extraordinary example of an environmental problem that we all share. And yet we oftentimes don't act like it, right? We don't act like it politically. We don't act like it in our daily lives. We don't act in the way that we vote or spend our money. Um, and so I think, uh, you know, the kind of Olmstedian vision of a of a community that cares both about one another and cares about stewarding their spaces as a group, as a as a community, um, that's something which we have you know we have a century or two of work left to do on. That's excellent. Thank you all. Uh, it was really fascinating conversation. And as I said, I'd love to turn it over. Got some questions from the audience. Um, uh, the first, Stefan asks, with the surge in interest in gardens and gardening from the pandemic, the green lining say, how can we best build upon that momentum and introduce young people to flow and his philosophies and work, which Garrett, you touched on a little just now. I mean, I certainly think that the pandemic in some ways highlighted just how important shared spaces and community are, because when all of those things were so ripped away from us, especially in the early days of the pandemic, uh, it, we actually just hosted a, a book talk a few months ago um, uh, by uh, editor Laura Bliss, who who put together these series of uh, participant-made maps of pandemic. And what she one of the things she pointed out was that what people really strove for, or what they desired during those months of pandemic, were were people and and nature that they you know that they didn't have access to. So I actually think that going through the experience of the pandemic and of people, you know, whether it's gardening in their own, you know, in a flower pot on their stoop or going to spaces like our great urban parks, I think it was a a, a really powerful reminder of just how crucial those spaces play in our shared life. Yes, absolutely. I think everyone really came to recognize the value to that, them personally and their mental health and these places of refuge from um, you know, the global pandemic. Um, this, I guess, is also somewhat for you, Garrett. Uh, Palma asks, I grew up near Boston Secret Olmsted Park, Dorchester Park, which is not part of the Emerald Necklace. Toward the end of the documentary, they mentioned the small owned parks across the country. Can you comment on those parks and what makes them more valuable than the big ones in some ways? Yeah, Boston has a, a, a really uh, rich sort of uh, landscape of, of lesser known Olmstead parks that aren't formally part of the Emerald Necklace. And then, of course, if you add uh, landscapes that were designed by the Olmstead Brothers firm and by the, you know, the, the sort of nearest followers of Olmstead, there's uh, there's so many of them. Um, I, I think in, in some ways it gets to some of what I was trying to articulate before and that, you know, we know Olmsted kind of from his crown jewels, right? Pro Prospect Park, Central Park, Emerald Necklace, you know, number of parks in other major cities. But this idea of kind of shaping cities at the city scale from, uh, you know, playgrounds all the way up to the, the grand um, uh, uh uh, uh, parks, uh, I, I think that that really gets very close to what Olmsted's vision was, right, is that these these places would be really well integrated into people's lives, into their neighborhoods. Um, and so they're in, in many ways just as important to uh, the, that living legacy of Olmsted in today's landscape. So I'm sure many of you have smaller, either directly Olmsted or, or Olmsted influence spaces in your own communities. 
Yes, the um, the Central Park Conservancy is actually very happy to be able to take care of the, uh, we started many years ago, at least a decade, maybe two decades ago, to take care of the historic parks in Harlem uh, because a lot of our board members really understood that we have the expertise and the Parks Department doesn't have the money to actually take care of these smaller parks. And they may have a gardener, they may have a maintenance person, but they don't have the crew. And so we go in uh, through our contract with the city now, uh, thanks to, I think it was Mayor Bloomberg, who um, said, you know, we need to take care of these disadvantaged parks that don't have the kind of community like Central Park has surrounding it. And so um, we're happy to step up. Uh, we have uh, staff in Central Park that only come to Central Park to have parties, but they spend all of their life in, in the other boroughs. And uh, I think it's important that the parks that do have the resources also have the expertise. We can hire the best people and we can share the expertise, even if it's just videos or uh, online classes uh, or really boots on the ground. Um, it's important that those who can do, do and share. And um, I think that's in the spirit of Olmstead. And uh, it's certainly, uh, it's what the, these small communities that don't have the resources need their help. And, and the bigger parks and the bigger communities in, in those metropolitan areas can really help. Yes, excellent. And this relates to that question from Boston, now heading over to California. Don asks, Hello from Mariposa, California, where Olmsted lived for three years and prepared the 1865 Visionary Report to protect Yosemite. What are your thoughts on that report's impact on the Establishment National Park Service? I'll, I'll, I'll tackle that. So it's it's kind of amazing. I mean, the best way to put it is Olmsted delivered. <laughs> always, Olmsted delivered this, basically he delivered this manifesto about the need for, um, for um, national parks to a group of journalists who were passing through Yosemite. And I always picture sort of spontaneous Olmsted, he'd written out this manifesto, but he said he was going to, you know, hey, you know, they, were sing, they were singing songs and drinking and so forth. Olmsted said, hey, I have a manifesto to read. And they read it to this group of journalists. And it, it takes a long time to read. I think it's about an hour and a half is how long it takes to read the manifesto. Well, it was ultimately lost, the manifesto. But um, the, he, he picked his audience well because the journalists who had gathered there, they all made reference um, in, in their own work, the, the, the articles that they were writing about Yosemite, about the travels they were making across the United States and so forth. So the best way to describe it is Olmsted kind of planted this idea, as he so often did, planted with the right people, this group of very notable journalists. It started to kind of ricochet out through society. And ultimately, um, the idea for the national park system was born. And Olmsted really gets, I guess, I guess you'd say an assist, or he, he sort of helped the notion along. And of course, he circled back around. Um, and once once um, there was more momentum, he, he was involved in early conservation efforts in places like Niagara Falls and so forth. So that's the best way to describe that sort of epic event um, from, from um, Yosemite Valley from 1865. The other really interesting thing about uh, Olmsted and Mariposa is, of course, he doesn't go out to California to look for parks. He goes out to be the administrator of a mining uh, venture. Um, and some of his writings about that community are, are, are really interesting because Olmsted was totally dismayed by the, the kind of frontier mentality of every man for himself, this sort of, you know, the miners came and went and didn't, you know, basically this sort of rapacious attitude towards the natural environment, to their own communities. Um, Olmsted saw it as a real contrast to the sort of New England towns that he had grown up with. Um, and, and, and I think that contrast was actually really instructive for Olmsted when he then later goes back to the East Coast and, and begins his landscape architecture work in that he 
he was really reacting against this kind of like wild, crazy, every person for themselves uh, 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 spirit that he found in the in the California frontier. Um, and it kind of gets back to to what I was saying before. Is, you know, we've that that mentality is still with us, right? You don't have to look far uh, in any city to find the kind of uh, you know crazy exploitative mining community sort of uh, of the present day, um, whether it's towards the environment, whether it's towards the community, whether it's towards, um, you know, our social fabric. And so, you know, figuring out how do, how do we move, move beyond that kind of a mentality? How do we use ch a changed attitude about our spaces and, and, the, and the people that we work with? Um, that, that's some of the unfinished legacy of, of the Olmsted vision. Excellent. Yes. Another example of how he led many lives and that much influenced his worldview. Um, I think we have time for maybe one last question. Um, I'm going to go to Palma, who asks, Olmsted was designing these parks for the people at the same time as Anne Carnegie was beginning to seed his palaces of the people public libraries. Would you consider this coincidental or symbiotic? I work in one of the places that that where that term uh, "palaces for the people" was was coined uh, at the Boston Public Library. I certainly don't see it as coincidental. Not not just because of. Uh, uh, the way I spend my time, um, but actually many of Olmsted's followers uh, remarked on this as well. Uh, in Boston, um, there's a very influential uh, 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 kind of uh, metropolitan park builder that that uh, he, he interpreted Olmsted for the Boston press, and he was also a, a huge advocate for the library system, as well as for other public amenities like schools and playgrounds and public baths. And so, you know, to, things that we do for free for the public, the things that bring us together, the things that we agree are in common, those are sort of basic structures of our common social life, right? They're, they're so akin to one another in the function that they play. So I, I, I certainly don't think it's coincidental. The late 19th century really is a moment where Americans go through this, this process of building institutions like parks, like libraries, like the free public school system and, and many others, um, which we're still very lucky to have, uh, though, as we've noted, uh, they don't last forever without, without care and without funding and without people advocating for them. That's exactly right. Sarah, Justin, any final thoughts? support your parks. Yes, absolutely. Justin, nodding in agreement. Nodding in agreement. The other thing I would say is I, just to reiterate what I said earlier, um, there's something about, I, I've just, I've noticed that when people are aware of Frederick Law Olmsted and aware of his role in whatever park or landscape creation is around, it just really transforms, the, the, the right word is stewardship, it transforms their appreciation of that landscape in a way that when it was not connected to this important historical figure, um, it wasn't. So it's, so I, I think, I think you know, just to continue what we're doing today and, 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 and um, you know, the, the effort to, to um, educate the public about Frederick Law Olmsted, his legacy and his role, I think it can al it always pays dividends in, in terms of how people come to appreciate and, and take care of, of, their, of the various uh, landscape creations that he left behind. Well, wonderful note to end on. Um, it was an absolute pleasure to be amongst you all. I learned a lot. Um, by watching this film and from listening to you all and your very thoughtful reflections on Olmsted's legacy and how that helped inform our thinking about the future. Um, and it's just been wonderful to be able to highlight and honor 200 years. Um, so Didi, I turn it over to you. Well, thank you so much. This has been a very lively, provocative, wonderful conversation as I knew it would be. There is something about Frederick Law Olmsted. He can be counted on to uh, launch and spawn these kinds of discussions. And so I want to say thank you to all of our incredible panelists today. I want to say thank you to our founding partners, 
our honorary committee and to the donors who made this celebration possible. Uh, special thank yous to Phil Laughlin, Betsy Schurgross, Jerry Wright, and Lucy Lawless, who were essential to organizing the Bicentennial uh, many years ago, and of course to the Olmsted Network Board and staff. As you have heard in the course of the last hour, uh, this has not been a sepia-toned celebration. Olmsted 200 has aimed to be the beginning of a renewed commitment to Olmsted parks and places across the continent. And so as we look ahead, we know, and as we've heard today, that Olmsted parks and places are threatened in many ways by climate change, by development, by lack of resources, by privatization. So we know that going out of this today, it will be up to us and our commitment and our courage to save these extraordinary places for the next 200 years. So I want to ask you, how can we continue to thank Frederick Law Olmsted? What is our action plan? And I want to follow up on a number of the themes we heard in the course of the last few minutes. Let's help our leaders understand that Olmsted parks and landscapes are indeed critical to the country's physical, social, and civic well-being, and so to the principles democratic spaces, physical and mental health, and community. And let's help our leaders understand that parks are critical infrastructure and they need sustainable long-term funding. Let's make sure that all people and all communities, including those who have been historically excluded, have access to parks. Let's encourage thinking at the scale of the problem, an idea that many of you have articulated in this panel. Health experts, planners, landscape architects, civil engineers, parks administrators, let's come to work and work collaboratively and think of the bigger picture. And uh, at the end of the day, let's remember that these parks and places did not just appear, they took generations of stewardship and will take generations going forward. That is why the Olmsted Network is laser focused on supporting the many extraordinary conservancies, friends groups, parks and landscapes around the country, which sustain and maintain these fantastic landscapes. So last but not least, let's keep working together. Our name, the Olmsted Network, reflects the diverse coalition of partners that have been building over the course of the bicentennial. As we look to the future, the Olmsted Network wants to work with you. We'll continue to have a brimming national calendar of events, national conferences, inspiring virtual and in-person programming, and we'll be debuting a new website in June. So to all of you, we are delighted that Frederick Law Olmsted brought us together, and we look forward to continuing the conversation. So see you soon, and many, many thanks.